everybody. Welcome to the Adventures in Brain Injury podcast. My name is Kevin Ballister. I'm a spirit traumatic brain injury survivor, given less than the 10% chance of recovery uh, beyond a persistent vegetative state. And today I'm super excited to be interviewing Dr. Dominic Diagostino, Professor Dominic Diagostino. Um, he's a tenured uh, associate professor at the University of South Florida. Morisani College of Medicine, and he's in the Department of Pharmacology and Physiology. He teaches medical neuroscience, medical physiology, nutrition, and neuropharmacology, which, as you all know, I'm extremely into all of those things. He is also a research scientist at the Institute of, the, of Human and Machine Cognition, AI stuff, we can talk a little bit about that. And his primary research uh, focuses on developing and testing nutritional and metabolic-based therapies for a variety of disease states and advancing the use of these therapies into human clinical applications. So excited to have you, Dom. Man, it's... Uh, we you, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's been too long. Yeah, it's... And well, how's it, yeah, it's been over like six months, right? Something like that. Yeah, we met at the Ancestral Health Symposium um, yep. in LA in, boy, I mean, when was that? July. December? December, something like that. I, I think it, no, it was summertime, wasn't it? Was it? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it just flies. It feels like it was a month you, or two ago. You live yeah. in Florida. It always feels like summer, right? It does, Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it was. Yes, it was. It was, it was summer. Yeah. So, so, uh, man, it's so good to have you on here. I really appreciate your, your work and you're, you're a busy guy. You're, uh, you're, why, why don't you let me know some of the projects that you're up to right now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I teach, my teaching is aligned with kind of like the research that we do. And uh, for example, I'm teaching medical neuroscience. So I teach about the, the action potentials, the membrane potential, the nurse equation, the golden AI. Yeah, I teach it like how neurons maintain a membrane potential and communicate to one another and everything sort of involved in that. And then signal transduction of neurons. Um, and then neuropharmacology, I teach dopamine. And, and then in the uh, physiology, I teach the whole GI section. So we can talk about the gut brain axis, but you know, that's my teaching in regards to, um, so pretty much, you know, kind of teach full time and get a lot of, a lot of my time is actually spent answering questions or preparing lectures and things like that. So, uh, I do that, but I also teach a lot of students in the lab and that could be, uh, we have a good number of honors undergrad students that come under us, uh, master students, PhD students, uh, high school students. And we have postdocs, research assistant, you know, research professors, uh, technicians working in the lab on a variety of projects. Uh, a lot of the work that we have done historically has been uh, projects by the Office of Navy Research, which is part of the Department of Defense. Uh, we have a NAVC project in humans at Duke University looking at ketone metabolic therapy for preventing oxygen toxicity seizures. Uh, and we did the sort of the, the animal model correlate of that in the lab. And that then set the way, paved the way for the human studies. Uh, we have studies using continuous glucose monitors in patients and looking at the, uh, CGM as a, as a behavioral tool to improve, uh, you know, everything from, psychological measures to metabolic biomarkers, insulin, uh, you know, inflammatory markers, things like that, things highly relevant to brain health. Uh, and then we have a lot of different projects on uh, mouse models of like neuro, neurometabolic disorders. Uh, so that could be glucose transporter, rare diseases like Kabuki syndrome, glycogen uh storage disease type two, for example, we had a project on Angelman syndrome. Each one of these projects sort of becomes a PhD dissertation. And we take a deep dive into the molecular mechanisms of these disorders. And even in the presence of a persistent molecular pathology, 
something like therapeutic ketosis, which is not, well, we didn't think it was actually changing the genetics, but it is changing the epigenetics. Uh, ketosis can help to manage and treat the disorder. Mm -hmm. So we primarily looked at that by just, you know, its ability to provide ketones as an alternative energy substrate. Uh, but more recently, like one of my students is looking at the metabolic control of epigenetics. So how the ketone body, beta hydroxybutyrate, for example, is activating or reactivating uh, genes that can be neuroprotective, that play a role in learning and memory, synapse formation, things like that. That has become a big focus of our lab, ketones as an energy source for one, but also ketones as a signaling molecule and a way to turn on genes through epigenetic mechanisms to help you know, uh, neurological disorders and actually enhance cognitive function and behavior. Nice, nice. And I really love that it's all about application. So for the yeah. listeners, I'm going to kind of break some of that down. Continuous glucose monitor, that's, that's measuring your, your glucose throughout the yeah. day. Yeah. Like you, yeah, it's like yeah. a patch and it just lets you know where, where your glucose is at. And, um, and that's really powerful because, you know, ketones, glucose are both fuel sources or substrates. So, yep. so when, when Dr. D'Agostino talks about you substrates. Explain very nicely in your book here, which I recommend to people. Thank uh, you. My friend. I like that, that uh, chapter you have in there. Thank you, man. Yeah. So, so there's substrates. And it, honestly, I kind of don't like the term ketogenic diet because it's kind of like saying the glucose diet. Um, that being said, you know, whatever. And like, who, who says the glucose diet, right? It's a substrate. And so we're talking about ketogenic metabolism. Using that as a fuel source for our brains um, has changes, positive changes in neurology for many different um, aspects. And I'll, I want to talk with you about some specific things with that. Um, I believe you've done research surrounding traumatic brain injury with mice in ketosis. Is that correct? Well, we uh, not directly, you know, we had opportunities in the past. Uh, but, you know, and to my wife is did not want to go down the path of doing a brain injury. <laughs> in animal. So what we did, we have we have models of brain injury without actually injuring the animal. So for example, we have, uh, one example would be, we have neurons that are grown and then form a neural network in a dish. And then we simulate traumatic brain injury by you know, literally scratching across it. Uh, so it would replicate, uh, you know, basically cutting the brain in half or, or damaging the brain in a particular part. And then we can apply certain things to the neurons. We have artificial cerebrospinal fluid, which would mimic the brain. And then we can alter various components of the artificial cerebrospinal fluid. And if we keep everything equal, and then we raise the ketones up to like two millimolar, it enhances the formation of new synapses. So if you cut all the synapses, you create like a physical line uh, and a damaged area, and then you can watch synapse formation, and then we can image that over time, and then we can also measure certain proteins like synapsin and you know BDNF and other things that are playing a role in enhancing that neuronal repair. So uh, I mean, we do that, and then we have models of uh, neurodegenerative diseases, you know, everything from Alzheimer's to ALS to different model diseases, uh, but we have never done sort of the messy work of actually you know inflicting hitting a brain, brain injury yeah. on on yeah. animals yeah that's it yeah we didn't it's some dirty actually, work i'm a, i've applied for grants when i was younger and i'm glad i didn't get them because i'm not sure i could you know use this apparatus that just slams the animal's head and and recover the military does a lot of research on that and i think it, it can be very informative not always predictive but uh, but I think there's, I'm I'm more into doing, uh, you know, human or cell based assays and various things that could give us answers to questions without necessarily having to, 
induce that kind of trauma. And all the disease models that we have, the mice are bred up and we do not hurt them in any way, but we let them kind of live their life. Uh, we have a longevity study now looking at, you know, the effects of the things uh, like ketogenic diets or ketone supplements on behavior, on learning and memory, on motor function and things like that. And these are fun experiments because basically you, the animal lives a certain age and you try to make the animal as healthy as possible and you enrich their environment to see how long they can live. And, you know, there, uh, we have some longevity studies going on now Beautiful. to do that. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I'm, I'm curious about, uh, do you work with seizures as well? Yes. Yeah, uh, a number of different seizure types. Some of them are genetic, like uh, seizures associated with like uh, Angelman syndrome, or we have a model of absence seizures, which is a, having a seizure, but without the tonic-clonic effects. So some people will have seizures you know, they could be like, and they'll just drop, they're called like drop seizures, or they'll just be like staring in space. And their brain is actually having a seizure, but it's not a grand mal seizure, also called a tonic clonic. So we have, we've done a lot of research on an animal model of absence seizures, but the powerful tonic clonic seizures that we've studied with ketosis are CNS oxygen toxicity, which manifests as very powerful uh, tonic clonic seizures and therapeutic keto. Well, fasting was shown to be helpful for that. And then we, uh, developed ketone metabolic therapy protocols. And then these are the protocols that we've vetted out and studied in animal models. And then we moved them to human, uh, clinical trials, uh, diets, and then, you know, different agents that are being, uh, we don't have the big human chambers and all the, but Duke, University has a massive environmental uh, research, the, you know, NASA, con you know, they contract out like NASA and DOD, they do a lot of research there. So we're running some human trials uh, and studies there. Nice. Nice. I, uh, I, I mean, I'm so interested in, in ketones as metabolic therapy. Um, early in my, in, in my brain injury, my mom you know, when she rushed out to New York after I was in a coma, um, she began to read the, re the literature and see that there was a metabolic cascade that occurs after brain injury um, that often, uh, specifically diffuse axonal injuries, that often causes way more damage than the initial hit with a, with a calcium cascade and, and things of that sort. And what uh, in, in, in my research, it's like, I'm seeing that, that that sort of metabolic cascade seems to be dependent on glucose metabolism. And when we bypass glucose metabolism, either through um, fasting or through ketogenic metabolism, which we use that instead, um, it's, it, it shows far better outcomes for, uh, for the patients, the participants. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it kind of falls in line with traumatic brain injury. If it's severe or if it's, uh, penetrating, uh, for example, penetrating traumatic brain injury, I think 80% of people will have seizures. Associated. And that's where it goes through the skull. Yeah, where it breaks into the it breaks the the bone in the skull, so that kind of classifies as uh, a penetrating. And then that, in that context, I believe it's upwards of eighty percent or more will have seizures. So it just made sense to me early on, like fifteen years ago, that the you know therapeutic ketosis has been a proven ant neuroprotective anti seizure strategy for many years, even independent of like the genesis of the seizure. And temporal lobe epilepsy versus absence versus you know, glucose transporter deficiency syndrome, you know, across the board, independent of the etiology, therapeutic ketosis is neuroprotective and profoundly anti-seizure effects, you know, even above and beyond any anti-convulsant that we know. And it's actually used when anti-epileptic drugs and multiple anti-epileptic drugs in high combinations fail. So in that case, only then do they actually pull the lever and use therapeutic ketosis. And in that context, 
about two thirds of the patients respond uh, pretty remarkably. I think a third have more than 90% seizure control and like 10 to 15% are what's called super responders, which means they have complete seizure control. And then they, when they discontinue the diet, they never have seizures again. So this really interested me. Um, and the, you know, the prototypical patient is Charlie Abrams. Exactly. Uh, and the yes. Charlie Foundation. So was, glad you brought that up. I was thinking yeah. the whole time. So Jim Abrams was a Hollywood producer, made the movie Airplane, actually uh, collaboratively worked with Meryl Streep to do the movie First Do No Harm. And that was, there's a movie about the ketogenic diet called First Do No Harm by Meryl Streep. It was kind of cool. Uh, and then that drew me to this as, you know, I, I, I majored in nutrition, but I, it's, it's weird. I did not know the ketogenic diet was a standard of care medical therapy. And I was like, wow, I started learning more about it. I talked to people at Johns Hopkins and, uh, in other institutes. And I realized, uh, I reached out to Dr. Zhang Ro, who was at Barrow Neurological Institute at the time. And now he's like director in chief of, um, uh, in San Diego, the neurology in San Diego, the hospital there. And he encouraged me to actually pursue this. And I actually copied and pasted his email and sent it to my DOD program manager. And they said, okay, well, let, okay, write up a proposal. And long story short, it was funded and it set us on the trajectory of looking at therapeutic ketosis for these powerful seizures. And, uh, and then we've expanded the use of ketone metabolic therapy outside of seizures for things like cancer, things like, you know, uh, ALS uh, and these rare genetic diseases that we're studying uh, that seem to be responsive. So uh, I, I think the world is, and I think traumatic brain injury is kind of like the low hanging fruit, uh, it, you know, it, and it's difficult. It's a messy area to research because the animal models are kind of, you know, stressful and to deal with animals that have traumatic brain injury, doing the actual traumatic brain injury is quite stressful, not only for the animal, but for the investigator. And, uh, and we've gotten a lot of data from cell models, but you, you know, people are looking for a drug, <laughs> you know, the, the funding agencies that uh, are funding the work are really mechanistically looking for a particular drug and particular pathway. And ketone metabolic therapy is pleiotropic, which means that there's multiple mechanisms likely working in synergy to, uh, to enhance neuronal growth and repair and actually uh, reduce the inflammation and associated cascade of events that result in neural injury. So much like the the anti-epileptic, you know, effects that they it's not working through a mechanism of any known drugs because it works when drugs fail. <laughs> so uh, so it tends to work with many different mechanisms in synergy. The more I do this research, the more I realize that reducing neuroinflammation is a big part of it because uh, you know, PET scans show that when you have a seizure, that increases inflammation in the brain. And and through the throughout the years, people have uh, contacted me that have you know disorders where you know they could have a viral injury. It could be something like you know herpes simplex virus. It could be uh, it could be Lyme's disease. It could be other diseases that cause neuroinflammation. And out of nowhere, they've had a seizure. And then they'll start fasting and doing ketogenic diets, and then that's controlled. So there's no doubt in my mind that you know inflammation can is so important to manage that with traumatic brain injury. But I think it's also part of the mechanism of the anti-seizure effect of the ketogenic diet. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, I working with clients, uh, and, and you said that they'll use the ketogenic as like a last resort even though it's m much, much higher safety profile than the drugs, but, you know, then I don't need to get too into it, but clearly they, they're going to fund drugs, um, which are patentable and ketogenic 
diet is not patentable, right? Yeah. So, so that's kind of the, the world we live in with this. Um, but yeah, working with clients prophylactically, even um, what I, for example, I have a client who, who tends to have her seizures a week before she has her period. And so prophylactically, we'll use exogenous ketones around that time and um, to prevent that, that sort of glucose metabolism. Um, and it's interesting. She gets much less hungry. She, and she doesn't eat as much then and is bypassing that glucose metabolism, which, um, which um, it, it seems to me is seizure activities dependent on glucose metabolism, much like the, the chemical cascade that occurs after brain injury that I was mm -hmm. talking about. That, and that, that may be why we see so much neuroprotection from, from ketogenic metabolism or fasting like they mimic each other right yep. and it's 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 super powerful stuff yeah um yeah so uh charlie foundation is really yeah. cool so charlie abrams and if i remember right he no no longer is on the ketogenic diet and he's no. fine right yeah, yeah so, absolutely not everybody. I would consider Charlie Abrams a super responder. Um, and I've communicated with dozens of adult epilepsy patients over the years that actually got, you know, seizures as an adult. Uh, one of them is Mike Dancer, and he's in the UK. Uh, if you Google Mike Dancer epilepsy, you'll find he's got a very interesting story uh, being in fitness and bodybuilding and things like that. And, uh, and, you know, he implemented the ketogenic diet and it had a profound effect at controlling his seizures, uh, but he will have occasional breakthrough seizures and he needs to maintain uh, a ketogenic diet. And he has a modified version, a little bit higher in protein, of course. It's like mm -hmm. very high in fish, uh, maybe some chicken. I don't think he can eat beef. Actually, following taking many drugs over many years created a lot of autoimmune issues with his gut and things like that so he had to you know so i think it helped repair his gut it helped balance out his brain energy and also the neurotransmitter systems and uh and it's like you know we connect i connected with mike maybe 2008 ish or nine and i recommended the diet and then you know super busy and everything and months went by he was having seizures every day it's like i haven't had a seizure and uh and he was he had he had some help from matthew's friends which is a, like a uk-based charlie foundation and they collaborate with charlie foundation and kind of the rest is history and it's like the doctor basically said mike you're going to die if you don't have brain surgery to remove part of the hippocampus and it was it was a uh, he took it upon himself because his doctors did not support the use of the ketogenic diet. They didn't have the infrastructure really to uh, medically manage patients, at least where he was at, I mean, even a major city. So to many doctors, this is just, it's like a foreign language to them. Like, you know, the ketogenic diet, they don't, the, the neurologist may know about it for pediatric epilepsy, but for adult epilepsy, actually the work by Eric Kossoff at Johns Hopkins was not published yet. I think that was in, came in 2008 or nine, uh, sort of the validation of the use of this approach for adult epilepsy. The pediatric epilepsy studies are already published. So Mike has had a very long road getting this and um, he inspired me to actually I put him in my TEDx talk, which was like 2012, I think. Uh, so I had to include Charlie Foundation, you know, Mike Dancer in my TEDx talk because it, it, he was like, we were, we were thinking about doing this in, in, you know, in our research proposal and I recommended it to Mike and he was like the guinea pig before I even started the studies in the lab. And it was like, Hey, go do this. And I was like, wow, it does work. You know, I just heard anecdotally and just. Uh, there was a few reports online at the time, but Mike kind of validated it because I knew his situation was the worst of the worst. And I was like, okay, I believe this is going to work in adults. Let's develop this as a mitigation strategy for Navy SEALs. Nice. <laughs> so, and then, you know, working with the Navy, uh, we had a workshop and my program manager was like, man, this, this looks very compelling. Like, so I got a big grant and 
that helped us fund a lot of our studies and kick kick us off. Awesome. So cool, man. Yeah. It's interesting that it's, you know, kind of a last resort. Um, I mean, yeah. there, there are some doctors that are like, yeah, you could do a ketogenic diet, but that's dangerous. Is yeah. It, is it dangerous? Uh, are the, are the drugs with the, like, a page of side effects or are those safe like you know and you're talking about kitty like what uh um you know acetone in my breath or something like that like it's not a big deal <laughs> and with, with drugs you're looking at long-term side effects especially mm. when it comes to kids something like uh there's a lot of drugs that have been used to control like infantile seizures and like status epilepticus and these drugs, when given just several times, can cause a delay in development that ultimately impairs, you know, IQ and, and just overall development. And mm-hmm. and that can be really sad situation when when kids are put on these these kind of drugs. I mean, Charlie yeah. was put on a lot, a lot of drugs. Yeah. And then that's why his father became very angry that this option was not offered to him. And and that, that's essentially why he made the movie First Do No Harm, just right. because he get more exposure for this because he didn't know it wasn't. I mean, he has, you know, being at the position that he was at, and the resources that he had, and just it was just he had to fly all over and basically go to Johns Hopkins from California, yeah, and, and to the doctors there. I mean, it wasn't even offered. It wasn't even an option, and he yeah. had the best options, you know, where he lived at the time. I think. And not to mention the kidney and liver damage that that drugs are doing as well, because your your kidney and liver have to do a lot of work to detox that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and that's why you know from from uh, the way I've steered my recovery is pretty simple. I weigh the risks and, and unknowns against the the degree and possibility of potential benefit, right? um and 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 see what what the deal is with those so when it comes to drugs that we don't know what the effects are or we do know the facts like all right that's got some some definite risks weight against the benefits okay um what's it 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 can prevent but then also we're damaging the kidneys the liver like all these things down the line and um and then it's like okay how about exogenous ketones what do those do right and um yes there's unknowns but so far so good and the degree and potential benefits is huge um you know i so so i i i have an article about about keto on my website feedabrain.com forward slash keto and then of course you've done enormous amount of work um in this department and um, and if you want to get exogenous ketones, you can get them there as well. You have exogenous ketones, or or your wife does, or something. Yeah, well, I I don't have a company, but you know, in the process of doing this, it's like uh, uh, we do a lot. Most of our work, published work, has been with ketone esters, mm-hmm. and I think yeah. they have tremendous applications for like maybe acutely for military operations and things like that uh although we observe that with long-term studies with the ketones and we look at the liver so if you take a ketone ester like 1,3-butanediol and then there's 1,3-butanediol which is ketogenic it's being sold as a ketone ester it's really not but if you 1,3-butanediol beta-hydroxybutyrate monoester is one ester there's 1,3-butanediol acetoacetate diester uh, and there's different. The thing with these ketones, a lot of our research is based on them, and they're they're very efficacious uh, acutely. Uh, but I, it's not something that I would like. I have them all over the house and <laughs> in the lab. It's not something that I would want to take like on a daily basis. Uh, they also taste pretty bad, and they're also they can be kind of expensive, and they're they're more like a drug. So that's mm-hmm. like the ketone in a drug because your liver one three. Butane diol is an alcohol, or it's a diol. It's a glycol, which is a diol or dialcohol, and it has to go through that liver pathway. Uh, so when we give the animals that, we in the beginning we were killing animals. We were putting them into ketoacidosis, and we had to back off on the dose and figure out okay they're metabolizing it, but it has very powerful effects 
at elevating ketones and preventing some of the seizures. But we do notice, you know, I didn't talk about it as much maybe as I should have in, early on, that there was some, you know, liver damage or evidence of liver damage. And it's like, okay, well, the 1,3-butene dial needs to be metabolized. And that's why we're seeing the liver enzymes go up. And then you see like a lot of red blood cells in the liver. And then over time, like evidence, you know, can start to happen of necrotic effects mm -hmm. in the liver. Uh, but that's actually giving them like every day, like you, and, but a lot of people like, you know, like I take ketones every day, but I take, you know, a ketone salt supplement, you know, I have it here. The keto start product is what I use. So that's actually the, the, we took the ketones that we used in the lab. Like I told you about the traumatic brain injury thing mm -hmm. where we do. So there's also an area of ketones that are not ketone esters. And they're called ketone salts. So you take uh, beta hydroxybutyrate and then ionically bind it to sodium, uh, potassium, uh, magnesium, for example. And when you consume it, it liberates the ketones and then the electrolytes. So it's like an electrolyte supplement <laughs> that delivers the ketones. So your ketones go up, you replenish electrolytes, which tend to be a little bit low if you're on like a lower carb diet. So, you know, that these are what I use. I only actually use one packet a day. I do like a quarter of a packet with creatine. So creatine monohydrate, you don't have to buy all these fancy creatines. The generic creatine monohydrate is plenty good enough. You know, I mix that. That's like one of the first things I take in the morning, like zero carbs, just ketones, creatine, get your brain firing. You know, I go do some work, start brewing some coffee that hour or two later, I'll sip on coffee. But then I'll take the rest of the packet and mix it with another, you know, two, three grams of creatine. And I'll take that before I work out. It's like my pre-workout. Real simple. I only take maybe, you know, sometimes no supplements, but because my diet's pretty good, uh, but usually ketones and then maybe like six supplements total. Mm. Some of the, like magnesium three and eight is very good. Mm. And uh, alpha lipoic acid. I think there are two supplements that I use, which would apply for brain injury. Alpha lipoic acid can help you overcome impaired glucose metabolism in the brain. So that could be helpful as part of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And, uh, and then magnesium can help to dampen excess glutamatergic uh, hyperexcitability by, uh, by attenuating the NMDA receptor activity, which if you have a lot of glutamate in the brain being released, not only like right after the injury, but, but a significant amount of time after. And even if you're like, you know, certain disorders and certain, even if you have infections, you know, you could have excess glutamate. And when people have headaches, when people are just anxious, it's probably too much glutamate. Magnesium can have a, a nice calming effect. Mm -hmm. So that's, and then I take, uh, actually another supplement that I take is melatonin and I take that every night. I did research and I published it in journal of neurophysiology to show that it's very, uh, protective to the hippocampus mm -hmm. preventing oxidative stress and damage. So I actually put a lot of time and effort on antioxidants to prevent oxygen toxicity seizures. Mm -hmm. And then I got nice data, but like the melatonin did not have anti-seizure effects, although it like helped you know, it was neuroprotective, but it wasn't, it didn't have anti-seizure. So I kept searching and searching. And then, then I stumbled upon, I started the melatonin stuff in like 2003 or four. And uh, I'm convinced that, you know, someone with brain injury should be taking it, you know, at nighttime as a supplement or maybe even higher doses, maybe even like five, 10, even 30 milligram, 30 milligrams. You know, some patients I've communicated with are really high. It's a, it's yeah. Permeable to the brain, it has very you know neuroprotective functions. Totally. So that's my short list of supplement. I'm not a big supplement oh. guy; I'm more a food guy. Uh, yeah. But it, but the keto well, the ketones are helpful too because not everybody is going to like really dial back those carbs to put them into ketosis. So you know you could do a low carb diet and you're getting the benefits of low carb diet, but you're not you're you're not in ketosis. So so adding like MCT oil which is great. Uh, and then some exogenous ketones on top of that is like the direction that I would recommend. And that's the exogenous ketone salts. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I found that, that 
ketone salts while like transitioning into a ketogenic diet makes it a lot easier because you know your liver needs to figure out all right i need to take this fat and turn it into uh, uh bhb beta hydroxybutyrate or ketone bodies right um and your liver is not used to doing that at first so it's like it's like, wait, what, what's going on here, right? I'm really, and you have these insatiable carb cravings, right? Yeah. So ketones, exogenous ketones really like calm that down. And, you know, you were talking about uh, uh, melatonin, these super high doses. Um, yeah, I, I've been, there's, there's, I've been reading up on that a bit and, you know, up, upwards of like 50 grams um or more a night when when like you know one or two gram two milli or not grams sorry 50 milligrams where yeah. you know typically you get a supplement that's like one like high dose is considered four milligrams um yeah. but again it's it's the safety profile of, of melatonin it definitely can get you feeling very groggy but uh but a powerful powerful supplement um for the brain and yeah. uh for yeah for for all sorts of things with the antioxidant um aspects of yeah. it but yeah. not anti-seizure uh not anti-seizure but it protects the mitochondria and you know i've been in correspondence with people that are taking like gram amounts of of melatonin and my first question is like what does that make you feel like during the day because you know mm. your body secretes so you're totally overriding that. So the idea, I mean, I take melatonin not for sleep. I sleep fine, but I take melatonin as a preventative. I mean, it's preventative for Alzheimer's disease, a preventative for you know, oxidative stress, and it has just so many benefits. Uh, some may argue, and I think uh, Andrew Huberman has talked about this in a podcast before, which made me go search the data that it could have a suppressing effect on the hypothalamus and actually like your testosterone and gonadotropin releasing more. But if you go to the data, there's no like human data to support that. Some data in animal models. And, you know, I've been taking like high doses since I was like a teenager, pretty much, you know, and I don't know, you know, I've always did blood work and everything has been fine. So I think your body kind of overrides that, but there's no doubt that melatonin is a hormone. Mm -hmm. and um, you know, it, it does have other effects outside of, you know, circadian rhythm. But uh, the point I wanted to make is that I'm in correspondence with people who took gram amounts of it, and they actually feel better during the day. Like, actually, mm. it makes them feel better during the day. Uh, and it does not make them groggy. I, I, I felt that if I take a larger dose of melatonin, I do get a little bit groggy in the morning, and maybe, you know, want that caffeine a little bit more. But this should be, you would think this would be dramatic. I think that taking three to five milligrams of melatonin is probably saturating your melatonin, you know, receptors in regards to sleep and wakefulness and things like that. But when you go up into like the really high levels, you're not augmenting your, you know, the sleepiness anymore, but then you're getting into situations where the concentration is reaching the mitochondria and having more of a, a mitochondrial, you know, metabolic effect. And, uh, and I think I'd like to revisit and go back. It's been like, it's literally been two decades since I did the melatonin research, but I would like to go back and revisit and, and study that for other neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah. And, it, and, you know, a lot of people are afraid of a negative feedback loop on that, you know, where, yeah. where basically receptors become, uh, less sensitive to it or your your body's endogenous or or your body's ability to make melatonin is turned down or something but that's yeah. not the case is it no it doesn't seem and like sometimes i will run out you know and i just forget to buy it on amazon and then it's like you know i'll cut or i'm traveling i forget to bring it with me although when i cross time zones i usually pretty I have like an international travel bag and like a domestic travel bag. Have it, I keep it in my international travel bag for, you know, those, those purposes. Uh, but if I forget to take it, which I often do, it doesn't seem to 
affect my sleep latency or ability to fall asleep or stay asleep. So um, actually, and I, I weaned off of it. And then I went and actually did blood work to look at my melatonin. And it was like, you know, nicely in the normal range. So, mm -hmm. and that's after taking it for literally 30 years. So, mm -hmm. so I don't have any fear, at least in my, I mean, everybody's different, but right. I'm just you know, giving my, my. Yeah. I've, I've similar, yeah. similar experience. Uh, yeah. I, I kind of, um, I actually get a bit groggy when, if, if I, if I go from like zero to a hundred, you know, um, yep. if I ramp up that, then my body is better at handling it. Um, yep. but yeah, I get groggy in the morning with it. Um, if it's, if it's a higher doses, but, uh, but in my understanding is that our cortisol is converted into melatonin. So, and you know, as long as we're producing cortisol, which we do, we're yep. producing melatonin, so it, it gets converted no matter what, which, yep. is, which is why this negative feedback loop doesn't occur. But anyways, the, this is totally tangential. <laughs> I wanted to talk with you about ketones. We're on, we're on melatonin now, which is totally cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I think, I, I think it's of interest to your audience, you know, and uh, I don't know, I haven't like visited the melatonin Wikipedia page, but I just, I studied this when I was younger and there's quite a lot of data behind it. So, I, and I think it's being used for a variety of other things. You know, it didn't pan out for us uh, uh, to use it for oxygen toxicity, just because it didn't have, it had neuroprotective effects, but didn't have anti-seizure effects. So the ketones hit both categories, right? They have really strong, uh, anti-seizure effects and they also have uh pretty remarkable neuroprotective effects so that's why i kind of put all you know switch all my time and effort actually from drugs to uh to studying ketones exogenous ketones okay. and ketogenic diet we study exogenous ketones time restricted feeding and then all the different variations of the exogenous ketones too and i think there's different formulations uh i also like to add that you know melatonin's or not uh mct oil is quite interesting and then if we add mct oil to uh ketone salts or if we add mct oil to uh ketone esters then we always got better effects so the mct is like uh it basically causes your own body to make its own ketones the mcts through beta oxidation of fats help you produce your own ketones while it delays gastric absorption and helps to promote a better what we call pharmacokinetic profile of the exogenous ketones so it's like you know you take an mct exogenous ketone mixture and the ketones go up and down and it shifts the pharmacokinetic curve to the right but the area under the curve is of ketones is quite higher if we're measuring ketones so and each and it's it's more than like an additive effect. So you can get, you know, higher levels of ketones uh, if we combine MCT and exogenous ketones than either one alone. And then there seems to be like a synergistic effect too. And I think that has to do with some dynamics we're trying to understand in the lab. So we have to do liver metabolomics to really start understanding some of this, which we're starting to do now. That's awesome. Yeah kind of speculation but like you know when we when we kind of jump start our liver with like some some exogenous ketones it's like oh you want me to make those oh look you already gave me the substrate cool like <laughs> yeah and it's yeah. just you know maybe that's what's happening i don't know but yeah very very cool um i was curious because uh something i've experienced with exogenous ketones is sometimes I, I and mean, by exogenous ketones, I mean the ketone salts, usually with the MCT in there as well. Um, but I have, uh, I tend to have um, just gut upset, like digestive problems with that. Like, what? What's Absolutely. your experience and and thoughts surrounding that? So I, I actually that inspired the formation of a uh, of a ketone salt balanced electrolyte formula that inspired like the development and testing of KetoStart. 
So pretty much all other ketone salts on the market, uh, especially if I take the ketone salts on an empty stomach, mm -hmm. send me to the bathroom. Like I, they, uh, they are fantastic laxatives. So, but you know, you're basically literally flushing the ketones and the electrolytes down the toilet. So you need to have a pretty unique uh, uh, electrolyte blend uh, to get maximum ketone absorption. And, and then some of the other things that people put in like erythritol or other sweeteners and things like that can upset or irritate the GI system. Mm. Uh, the electrolyte blend that seemed to really maximize ketone absorption was interestingly like the same ratios of, of salts that the supplement element has LMNT, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, Rob Wolf's uh, company. Yeah. 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 Uh, right. Yeah. Yep. So, and I, I guess it's probably not coincidence, right? Cause we, I mean, we yeah. tested everything and it was like, this formulation seems to just like totally optimize absorption and reduce gut. And it's like, when you look at the numbers, it's like, man, maybe Rob, <laughs> Rob, Rob knew the correct electrolytes, you know, formulations for absorption. So I, I think that, and then, you know, those electrolytes are bound to, I, I forget what they're bound to, but in like keto start, they're bound to the ketones, right? So you're delivering electrolytes. I still use element. Actually, I'll do a keto start, a, a pinch of element because it's pretty strong. And then, uh, and then I'll put some creatine in there. You know, five grams of creatine with water on empty stomach is a gut irritant for me. So that's why I break it up into two, like two or three gram dose, you know, two or three grams in the morning and then two or three grams in the afternoon. And, you know, I buy a quality, you know, supplement, um, I think optimum nutrition or something like that. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, there's more research on creatine monohydrate and more studies than any other nutritional supplement on the market like easily. So uh, if that's something your viewers or, or followers are not using, yeah, definitely creatine, you know, is, is definitely should be on the list of supplements, you know, yeah, very important for people that are not eating a lot of meat. But even if you're eating a lot of steak and meat, uh, you could probably top off your creatine levels with creatine monohydrate, you know, two grams a day, three grams a day, something like that. No. And I don't think you need to cycle it either but it does seem to synergize well with exogenous ketones. So you got the ketone energy, you got the creatine energy, then you got the electrolytes, which basically enhance absorption, maybe expand your blood volume a little bit uh, for, for when you're working out and that can be beneficial. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, high school getting all, all swole with creatine. <laughs> um, and, then, and then like, you know, but it was like, not really strong, but definitely like swole. And then, uh, sure. but but then you know after brain injury, seeing the uh, the positive effects neurologically and whatnot of having having creatine involved um, is 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 a really good thing to stack up there. But uh, you know, I really like what you said about how nutrition first. Um, and that's absolutely in line with, you know, I say it in my book, it's like, we didn't evolve eating isolated nutrients in pill form. We evolved eating food, animals, plants, things that are available to us, you know, um, our food wasn't created in a lab, right? Um, so, so that being said, uh, the, like, for example, MCT oils, um, where, where can we find those in the food supply? So MCTs would be a bit difficult to get, you know, uh, coconuts, right? So there's palm uh, kernel oil or palm oil, but then coconut. Uh, I don't know if you had Mary Newport on, but I she would be a great guest yeah. to have. Yeah, uh, I agree. She is like the leading expert on this. I helped write the foreword to her book with my uh, previous PhD student, Dr. Melanie Brownlow. Um, so yeah, it'd be hard to get like, so a good quality coconut oil, I'd recommend getting it. Mm -hmm. And then coconut oil also has other oils that are beneficial, like lauric acid, for example. And lauric acid can have antiviral effects. 
viruses are neurotoxic, you know, CMV, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, herpes simplex virus, uh, the lauric acid can coat the virus and kind of render it, you know, relatively inactive. Uh, that's a theory, at least. So there's that. And then, yeah, I'm all about food sources. You know, the big one is fish oil, especially for brain injury. So my wife just did the omega quant test and had about a third of the amount of DHA and EPA that I have. We do eat, I mean, we go out and eat salmon, you know, once a, once a week or so, but um, or we'll cook it at home. But I eat, like I have sardines in my bag here, right? So mm -hmm. I, I eat fish, pretty much mackerel, sardines. And I'm a huge believer that a lot of the benefits, a lot of the research on fish oil are just by eating fish, mm -hmm. right? So if you can eat fish and I was not taking a fish supplement and just eating fish. And when I got my levels checked, I mean, they were like off the charts, omega-3, very low omega-6. Uh, but my, my wife, on the other hand, does not like fish enough to eat as much as I eat and would have to supplement it. So, you know, you gotta be careful, like mm -hmm. Nordic naturals, you know, they're, they're, they've been around since the 1980s. They have like a super legit Nordic naturals, mm -hmm. probably a, a, a good fish supplement, uh, a few others, but I'm usually hesitant to recommend it, you know, mm -hmm. cause, uh, uh, because I eat, I, I don't purposely don't supplement fish oils because i think it's important to get it from fish I like some it. people will not eat fish <laughs> right exactly yeah you know i i have a uh fish oil supplement um uh that's that's really powerful um it's it's dha concentrated um uh, mono uh glyceride so, so, yep. so uh, triglyceride is is considered better than S than uh, ethyl ester form. Um, yep. Monoglyceride is what our our body does is break the triglycerides into monoglycerides so they can yep. go directly into the cells. Um, on top of that, it also emulsifies uh, the fats um, that are in your foods. Like it, it acts kind of like bile almost and it emulsifies. Yep emulsifies fats for absorption so it, it's really powerful but uh you can also go to ifos ifos the international fish oil standards i think yeah um, yeah yeah I think I've been, yeah and they they rank all these yeah. supplements and they'll they'll get you they'll they ensure it's a good a good yeah. fish oil because you know if you're eating rancid fish oils you're not doing your body any good, you know? No. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, a, you know, the, and, and it used to be wild west in the supplement world of like, you don't know where, what's coming from, whatever. And I'm really glad that we've come together and developed some standards and found some ways yeah. of getting really high quality um, uh, products to people. Yeah because it's so important I'm guilty of that you know i was just gonna i bought like a bunch of fish oil for my dogs because but didn't want to go like the the expensive route you know nordic naturals they're kind of pricey uh but i think they have a dog supplement too but i mean that's what i would use if given the option i mean there's a couple other good companies too i don't have any association with nordic naturals but uh but, you know, I bought some stuff for the dogs and I and I opened the bag of fish oils and I was just going to and it was like it smelled like fish. It smelled fishy. And that's the telltale sign that, you know, these fish oils are oxidizing, that they, they give off volatile organic compounds that are indicative of oxidation. And once you start the chain of fatty acid oxidation, it's like a feed forward process. Then it's like it becomes exponentially higher over time so uh, so yeah just something to consider you know when you're buying fish when you're picking official supplement i would you know go to that website choose reputable brands the company should have been around for more than you know ideally like two decades so pick your pick your and pick your companies uh selectively i guess totally totally yeah well, um, what are you up to these days? Like, is there anything you want to announce to the audience um, about yeah, what, you're, what, you're, what you got going on? Yeah, thanks for asking. Well, uh, 
I maintain the website ketonutrition.org. So we have different writers on there. So uh, we have blog, to blog topics on a variety of different topics. And I think we should do a designated one on traumatic brain injury. We'd love to work with you on that. We have guest we'll writers coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so ketonutrition.org uh, is where I put a lot of time and effort on uh, outreach stuff. Uh, I'm on a variety of podcasts, so uh, sign up for the newsletter, and the newsletter will basically is uh, the different products that I'm testing, self-experiments that I'm doing, podcasts that I'm on. When this podcast come out, I'll put it in the newsletter, blast it out to our, our subscribers, uh, and then I'm a co-host for the Metabolic Health Summit with Dr. Angela Poff, my former PhD student, now research associate, and uh, and Victoria Field, who uh, is a fitness professional, but also prior newscaster, I think NBC, and uh, and also uh, uh, an expert in nutrition and and you know working with patients and things like that. So we we the three of us host Metabolic Health Summit, but we also started a podcast called the Metabolic Link, and you probably never heard of it because it just launched and we just got a couple episodes out. As mentioned, we'd love to have you on. <laughs> and uh, so I've been, you know, dividing my time between full-time teaching, full-time research, and then educational outreach, which is really tied with the research and teaching that I do on neuroscience and physiology, nutrition. I'm very much into fitness and working out because I think there's a synergy, uh, also a synergy when it comes to brain injury that you have nutrition, and exercise, you know, one in one does not make two in this regard. I think the two are synergistic. So one in one equals three. I think the benefits of exercise can augment nutrition and vice versa. So uh, I'd like to steer our research into to like objectively analyze it's a therapy. You kind of have to study that therapy in isolation, right? Uh, but I'm very interested now in formulating and putting certain diets and supplements together and then testing that, but then adding different types of exercise to help uh, enhance, you know, muscle retention as it pertains to longevity, uh, cognitive ability, uh, inflammatory biomarkers, and, you know, in animal models, testing it there, and then moving that, moving the science to human application. That's, I think that's a theme of like, our website, like moving the science to human application. And that's what really got me interested in, in doing more outreach because the stuff that we we're studying in the lab has direct and immediate translatability. And that's why it's kind of fun to talk about. That's so perfect. Yeah. Science too. The, 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 what is it? Uh, from theory to practice. That's uh, yeah. uh, Keith Norris from Paleo Effects, yeah. who's, who's a mentor, uh, just family to me. And um, yeah, he's always said from theory to practice, you know, and I really love that. My first presentation, my first keynote presentation um, after my brain injury was called synergistic therapies, how therapies done together are more powerful than them do, done yeah. on their own. And when it comes to research, what you're saying with these isolated variables, you know, I'm recovering. I'm not isolating variables. I'm not, I'm not going to find yeah. out like, okay, I'm not going to do anything but this one therapy and see what happens, right? No, 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 no. There is a synergistic effect that happens with all this stuff. So I was, you know, doing neurooptometry and functional neurology and nutrition and uh, ketosis and bringing in all these different aspects in order to heal myself. And I yeah. think, you know, bringing this like stack to be researched um, is, yeah. is a really cool idea. Um, so in, in, in my training in, in uh, functional nutrition, it wasn't so much protocols, but more systems of how we can find what the protocol should be for this individual. And I, I would love to personalize, yeah. implement personalized like like building systems and having those systems be tested rather than here's mm -hmm. the single drug that is the magic bullet and this is going to work for everybody yeah it never works right yeah so and, yeah you know 
it's not, I mean, nutrition's a big, powerful lever. And then, you know, supplements are like a little lever, right? But uh, I think like bigger level, level levers too are, uh, and nutrition ties into this too, is sleep mm-hmm. and uh, sleep reduction or sleep, <laughs> uh, sleep in general and stress reduction. So sleep, stress reduction, and probably one of the biggest hacks that we have, not, not for everybody, is actually to have a pet, like a dog, you know? So for us, uh, dogs are a form of therapy. It's like canine therapy. There's a, a farm right by us called Equine Assisted Psychotherapy. So <laughs> I meant to go in there and, and check them out. Uh, but and we have cows and we have sheep and we're fostering, you know, uh, puppies and we're looking for forever homes for our puppies. Uh, but we, a pet, like a dog is on a schedule where you have to, we have, we've got to walk them day and night. So after our breakfast and after our dinner, we walk them, it keeps us in shape and we're attentive to them and they eat what, what we eat. They have the same diet. Nice their microbiome they keep us active you know uh they they actually you know there's just amazing amount of things that they do to your body like increase oxytocin you know they get you moving they just uh and the relationship that you have with them so it's it's pretty big a big component of our life and it's probably one of the biggest hacks so there's like sleep stress reduction pets but also cognitive engagement uh, would synergize. That could be learning a language. It could be playing an instrument. My wife really wants me to, you know, go dancing with her on the weekends. Uh, she does dance classes and which is great because you have physical, cognitive, and then social, like synergistically combined. And, you know, all the top longevity researchers are adding now that dancing is like the major hack. So maybe I should do it, but, um, (laughs) So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for people to, uh, and when it comes to brain repair from traumatic brain injury, to leverage nutrition, supplements, exercise, sleep, wear, wearing a device to track your sleep. Because sometimes some of the things that disrupt your sleep are not always obvious. So, I mean, you could get, I have a Fitbit charge here. It's like 120 bucks, but now you can get it for like, 40 bucks 50 bucks and then it'll you know give you good good information on your sleep uh you know the pricier ones will give you fairly good hrv data not that pricey maybe like 120 bucks get a, a fitbit charge or something like that or, or an aura ring too which i use mm-hmm. so, yeah super i use a bio strap I'm not wearing it right now. oh yeah yeah those Very are good. great yeah yeah yep. bio straps excellent yep yep yep, yep. Um, yeah, man, we have more in common than you even know. <laughs> so I, I have a, I have a dog, um, who's kind of, um, uh, he's, he's what, 15, 16 months old now. Yeah. And he's, he's been like, he's, he's occupied a lot of my life for, for some time now. Cause I just, yeah. I, I love him and I've trained a few dogs um I, I train them to be service dogs and and he's phenomenal i i love training animals it's like something that's so good for me cognitively and for for the connection i mean and when i'm training a dog it's like i'm not trying to get them to obey me i'm trying to build a synergistic or uh symbiotic relationship yeah. you know where 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 where, where uh, he wants to please me and i want to hang out with them right and like it's like yeah. it's, it's all over that so and i i uh, i feed him raw meat for the most part yeah. you know it'll be raw meat liver and yeah, yeah. and sometimes we have like canned mackerel because it's pretty cheap so and i eat it too yeah. so i'll give him a canned mackerel and uh, egg yolks raw egg yeah. yolks liver raw meat canned mackerel oh we also use uh, a pet we use a it's freeze-dried i think a visionary uh visionary pet food which is like a little bit pricey but it's like very low carb ketogenic mm-hmm. top end so we'll kind of mix that in with it too especially if we're if we have like a, a 
because not all not everybody like sitting your dogs or taking care of your dogs wants to like you know do the raw meat liver kind mm -hmm. of thing too so we'll use that uh we give them a little bit of that each day but yeah pet nutrition that's a whole nother topic let's that's talk a... about that. <laughs> yeah. i would love to also man yeah, yeah. It's such a pleasure to be spending some time with you and uh, and chatting. I I I, you know, I'm 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 in Sarasota right now. Yeah, we're like an hour north or something like that. We got to come over to our farm and see the lab, and yeah, we'll and do I'll another podcast. Too. Yeah, podcast. yeah, let's do it. Yeah, and um, what what's happening? You also do stuff in the lab um yeah tell me about what what kind of things you got going on in the lab i would love to see that while i'm out there yeah yeah uh getting you inside the facility is sort of like there's like you know security and, and kind of you know to get into where we actually house the animals but we do some very cool experiments on behavior where we look at like cognitive function uh my student developed an olfactory learning test where we couple certain sense to certain uh, cognitive tasks and behavior to basically look at learning and memory with and without ketones. So we have that going on. We have animal models of different neurological disorders that we're studying. Uh, and we have these hyperbaric chambers where we put in animals and then we pressurize it to where they, we push, it, push them to having a seizure. Right. It sounds kind of cruel, but it's quickly reversible. And we're doing the same thing in humans. So we have volunteers that come up and we actually push them to seizure, but we're doing that at Duke University. So uh, it's no different than what we're doing to, to our humans. And it has to pass, you know, an IRB. Uh, and we do that. We develop the, a ketone metabolic therapy. And in the animals, we have a biosensor that looks at uh uh, diaphragmatic EMG, uh, EEG, uh, body temperature, you know, so we, we have a lot of different metrics coming from the animal. We also have cameras set up to look at behavioral seizures. And so the idea is basically to really develop a protocol to detect an, an incoming seizure and then to uh, decrease that. So, and we've been able to essentially create like super rats <laughs> so now we're uh we're and and some of the things that we've tested are ketone esters which are very powerful so we have to gently apply these things to humans because <laughs> they have the potential to do harm you know if we do the doses too high so you know that that's again why i personally use the ketone salts because i'm getting you know the benefits and and they taste good and and i'm not you know in the if I'll have to say that if I was forced to do a dive outside of the dive tables and to be, you know, using a high pressure oxygen at very high depths, I would probably want to dose myself with a ketone ester and not the salts. But pretty much every other scenario, I would rather do like a, a ketone electrolyte salt formation. So we're, we're doing that. Uh, we have cancer studies that we're doing, and then we have cell based studies that we're doing. In the sure. lab, so we, we have a hyperbaric biomedical research lab. We have a metabolic medicine lab. And then we have an animal facility where we do like a lot of our behavioral experiments and stuff. Oh, man, I am so glad I asked about this. That's that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, yeah. And are you a diver? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, nice. I've been a recreational diver since college. And then I did a more advanced training and then ultimately training to do what's called saturation diving. And I did, uh, I was on NASA's extreme environment mission operations and I trained with astronauts, uh, Shell Lindgren, Samantha Christopher Eddy, Jessica Watkins, uh, who were just up on space station, SpaceX, uh, crew four. And we, wa we went over to Kennedy and watched them launch. We met them before, but we lived with them. Like I lived with Shell in the habitat. He was like the bunk right, right below me. And uh, we lived with him for 10 days. We trained with them at NASA. And then we lived in a hyperbaric environment uh, where we, I stayed in ketosis. We did, we wore the aura rings with uh, Polar V800, collected a lot of data. Some of it we published, a lot of it we still have to publish. Uh, I was on Nemo 
22 and my wife was she's a more experienced diver actually Jilla, she was on uh nemo 23 which is an all-female uh mission so yeah we have we have uh saturation diving under our belts we have some nasa analog training under our belts and and then we were pis on like you know five or six irb protocols to do research on that so and that's kind of separate from research that we did at USF. You know, I had to take, you know, vacation time and stuff to do that. Uh, but it was super fun and it was super intense. And I learned a lot and uh, made some great friends with very cool people at NASA and with astronauts. And also the team at NASA that runs that at Mission Control, just amazing people at NASA. They're just like so professional to work with. And it was probably the, one of the best experiences of my life, uh, living underwater for, for 10 days. It was very fun. <laughs> wow. Wow. You, you, you're so cool, Dom. <laughs> That's so cool. So. Yeah, I'm, just, yeah. I'm very grateful to be able to, uh, I mean, I had a love of diving, but yeah. to actually be doing research on diving and it's just, so cool. yeah, I have to pinch myself sometimes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. um, I'm, I'm learning how to dive right now. So, uh, Oh, fantastic. Yeah, 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 I'm excited for it. I'm excited. Yeah, for man. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, when I'm when I'm out there, I'd, I'd love to see these these some of the, some of the work you're doing with all this. Um and uh and yeah, let's let's figure out when we can make that happen and Get together some stuff and um yeah. make some more some more magic happen. 100%. I'm all for it. Yeah. Nice. Let's I'll look at my calendar. I'll send you some dates and times and things that would work and uh it'd be great too. I mean, maybe uh come visit the house too and uh we have a big pond. We go diving in the pond. I've never done that, but uh, <laughs> I swim in it, but I haven't went like scuba diving in there. There's alligators in there. But uh yeah, let's make it happen. Sounds adventurous. <laughs> yes. All right, my friend. Uh until next time. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Kevin. Someone take me to a doctor.